Okay, so this is a paper on uh, the effect of immigration on the rural economy that migrants leave behind, so emigration. Uh, and it's co-authored with Ali Akram, at, who was at Evidence Action, and Shamil Chaudhary at the University of Sydney. And uh, by way of motivation, I'll have two motivation slides, one on research, one on policy. Okay. So ever since we started thinking about the development process, Rural urban migration has been a very integral part of that process. You know, going back to the models of Arthur Lewis, Harris, and Todaro, right? it was about structural transformation that came with people moving away from rural areas and into more productive urban sectors. Okay? And empirically as well, migration has been a feature of the development path taken by virtually every developing country. So this was a feature of US Canadian development in the 19th century with agricultural productivity growth, there's massive movements out from rural to urban areas. This is a feature of Chinese uh, development in the 20th century. So this massive movement that took like 150 years in the US and Canada, in China it reportedly happened in only 25 to 30 years. Right? That kind of a big shift. Right? And then the, in terms of data that we have, even like inter-census data from the US and Canada suggests that a fifth of the US Canadian population moves every uh, five year interval. But here I'm cheating a little bit because a lot of those movements are now urban to urban. It's not, it's not just rural to urban. But the data that we have in the developing world, uh, thanks to excellent work by Mark uh, Rosenzweig and Andrew Foster in tracking people in the long run, in India and Bangladesh, about a quarter of people move over a 70 to 20 year period. Okay? So in theory, it's been important. Empirically, it's been important. Now, research on the effects of migration, has that literature has largely focused on the effects on the migrant and his or her immediate family who might benefit from remittances, right? But then there's this broader question of what happens to the economy as people move out, okay? And so uh, this is an important enough topic that every 10 years or so, there's a handbook chapter written on rural urban migration. And in these handbook chapters, I've went through the generations of them. They always say, oh, it might deprive source regions of critically needed human capital, all the able-bodied men leave, and that might make everybody else worse off, poverty inequality goes up, et cetera. Right? And then finally, the most recent handbook chapter, Andrew and Mark write down, oh, it would be nice if somebody generated some evidence on this topic. <laughs> right? And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Yes, I, I am going to be talking all, all about circular seasonal migration today. Okay? And I think that's important. In fact, I would say that Compared to, I mean, we, in the literature, we talk a lot about permanent moves, right, or movements in one direction. But in terms of circular seasonal migration, they're an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude much more common, right? And, and I'm glad that you brought this up because that's exactly where we're going with the data. Okay. Okay, so now I don't want to, you know, we, we will generate evidence on this topic, but of course, you know, some of this is not necessarily really good economics. Like even the New York Times recently complained after the Nepal earthquake that, Look, Nepal is suffering now because all the men had migrated. Right? But I don't want to beat up on a, like a straw man. So let's think more seriously through the economics of what might happen. Right, there might be negative as well as positive spillovers. So on the negative side, right, uh, in a model you could easily generate the following. That if skilled workers leave and there's some complementarity in the production function between skilled and unskilled, maybe the unskilled workers will be worse off. Okay? And another thing uh, that you get out of like economic geography model is agglomeration benefits. So, so of course we think they're larger in cities, so overall productivity should improve, but they might make the rural areas worse off. That's on the negative side. But, on, but we also have good reasons to believe that there might be positive effects if some people leave. So first, there's going to be general equilibrium labor market effects. So lots of people leave, that's going to make it easier for the people who remain behind to find work, and it's gonna bid their wages up. Right? They, might, they might benefit from that. Okay? And it might also make it easier for others to also migrate and take advantage of higher urban wages. Right. Um, and, and that's, you know, we know that networks are important in determining migration patterns. Right? And, uh, and so in our earlier work, we do see that like, risk is an important determining factor on whether people just decide to move. Right? And if, you're, if you move in a group or other people are already there to help you, that form of risk sharing might be a positive, like, attracting factor of migration. And then, of course, migrants might bring money back or send money back home. If there's a circular migration, they might bring it back. And that might benefit that economy as well. Okay? So it could go in either direction. Okay, so we'll model all this and we'll look at what the data tell us. I, think, I, yeah. I guess maybe it's somewhat implicit in there. Can yeah. you also think of changes in the perceived the returns to location? In the population? Yes, that's right. Absolutely. Okay. I'm glad this is being recorded because I don't have a pen. <laughs> 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 I, I, I'll listen to my presentation later. <laughs> uh, okay. 
All right, so now some policy motivation. So, so the, here I'm going to go over really quickly because I've given this talk uh, in the same place that uh, in the same places that Taryn has given this given her talk from yesterday morning. But in the two earlier places, I gave my talk first, and then she free wrote on my slide, so I'm just going to free write on hers. Right? <laughs> there are big rural urban productivity gaps that macroeconomists have pointed out that uh, across the world. So this paper by David Lagacos, Doug Gollin, Mike Wall point out that there is about a 300% gap in rural versus urban productivity. Wages are about three and a half times higher in urban areas. In developing countries, they seem to be about five times higher. Okay? And you know, so one, you know, so that's a big puzzle. The puzzle is why are people not moving to take advantage of those higher wages and staying back in unproductive rural areas? Okay? Now, one simple answer to the puzzle would be that, oh, it's all selection. So the people who are in the city, they have city-specific skills. People who are in the rural areas, they don't. Right? Just because there are wage gaps doesn't mean that there's an efficiency gain from reallocation. There's absolutely no misallocation here. Right? However, like we, we've done some research to suggest that's not true. And the, the main research I'll point to that this paper builds on is my earlier work with uh, Garrett Bryan and Shamal Chaudhry, right? where we show that if you were to induce some people to move seasonally away from rural to urban areas, those people in that experiment do a lot better in the city. Okay? So if the same person is doing better, then it can't all be selection. Maybe selection is part of it, but it's not all of it. Okay? And, and so these gaps do persist, especially in cases like you know, uh, Paul's work on uh, absence of roads. Seems like that's a friction that's, you know, that's creating some gaps between what people do in rural areas, what they do in urban areas, or visa restrictions between Malawi and South Africa, or absence of bridges in this case, a paper by uh, uh, Wyatt, oh, your colleagues, uh, Wyatt Brooks and Kevin Donovan. Okay. Um, okay, so now, so in this paper we show that, look, if you induce people to move, they do better. Okay? However, if you induce lots of people to move, right, they, they, you know, things might be different. Right? There might be effects in urban areas, which we won't be able to say too much about today. There might be effects on rural areas, right? and we'll focus on the, on the rural effects. Um, yes, but it's going to take me a couple of years, okay? Because we are moving people at that scale. I mean, no? Some villages, maybe we should shut them down, at least from a policy Yes, yes. So we're going to be inducing up to 70% of some villages to move okay. today, right? Okay. And, then, uh, and then, oh, so when, I, when you said everyone, I okay. thought you meant what happens in the city. That's where we're going to next, okay. right? Which requires not only 70 or 100% of the villages to move, but large numbers of people to move into the city. We're, we're getting there. So short answer to your question, I'll give you in an hour. Uh, the bigger answer, I'll give you in like three years. Okay, um, okay and then um, a broader, uh, uh, broader connection to literature is that you know, in development, we have lots of randomized controlled trials we're running on you know, uh, often doing, evaluating very specific programs. Now, if you scale these things up, there might be market level effects. Right? So if you were to go you know, train a few people, you know, maybe they do better. But if you train everybody in the same skill, you know, they might compete with each other in the labor market and it doesn't work as well. If you give some people goats and some training, they do a lot better. But if you give everybody goats, maybe the price of goat milk falls and they don't, they don't do as well. Okay? And so this, in this paper, we'll be thinking about those types of general equilibrium effects. And I, I'll, just, oh, I'll, I'll just make a connection to an earlier talk I gave at this same conference exactly, I think, three years ago. Uh, and there, you know, sometimes these general equilibrium effects can be a little complicated. So today, the model will be very simple. But in this case, when Mark and I looked at uh, general equilibrium effects of giving lots of people insurance, what happens is that if you, in, you know, if you sell insurance to people who cultivate land, in India in this case, right, so they take more risk, right, which is great, which is exactly what we want them to do, shift away from safe technologies to higher growth, risky technologies, right. But when they take more risk, that makes the people they employ, the landless laborers, Right? they now face a much more risky environment. So it's actually possible that you make some people worse off, the people who are least able to handle risk, by giving some people uh, insurance. So, so in this case, I mean, general equilibrium is really important for us to think about the, the, to do comprehensive program evaluation. Okay. All right, so now what, 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 what is the intervention today? It's really literally just getting people on buses. Okay? So the idea is if there's seasonal poverty and seasonality, um, in rural areas, right? One way to address this is maybe move people to where the jobs are. Okay, and here's what we ended up doing in Bangladesh. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my earlier paper, because 
uh, spending just a couple of minutes on those results may, will make this talk go, go much better. Okay. So what we did was we did a randomized control trial. We had a control group, but in the treatment areas, we just induced some people to move by paying for their round trip bus fare plus a few days of food. So we're ensuring the travel and the contract is you'll get this money if one person from the house moves, right? And you, you can go, I mean, there's no other condition. So you just have to move, go and try to find work in city. And we gave general information on like what, what, what you can do in the city. Like here are the sectors you can find work, here are the average wages, et cetera, right? And then people went and found work often in construction or rickshaw pulling. This is in Bangladesh, okay? And they brought money, they send money back home. And, uh, and then we tracked what happens to them and to their families. Okay, that was the program. And the reason we're, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about seasonal migration, like Tanya pointed out earlier, is that this is most sensible to do during the lean season in the rural area. So the urban uh, area is not very seasonal, urban markets are not very seasonal. When the rural agrarian economy, like you have lots of work during harvest in January, you have lots of work, labor demand in August when you plant, but in between September, October, November, December, labor demand is low. Okay? Because you're mostly, like structure of the economy is such that you're just mostly waiting for the crop to grow. Right? And so there's gonna be some weeding tasks, et cetera, but there's much less work, and so wages fall. Okay? So this is the most sensible time to try this out. So we did. Okay? All right, so here's what happened when, uh, when we did this earlier. Um, we were able to induce, based on that $8.5 transfer, about a quarter of households to try it out. They, uh, you know, there was a 35% migration rate in the control group. It jumped to about 60% in the treatment group. Okay? And when they moved, right, this is the late estimate, uh, using this as my instrument for migration. Okay? Your family, the bottom line result is that your family consumes 600 calories per person per day more. Okay? So during this uh, you know, seasonal famine period, it's moving from two meals a day to three meals a day. Okay. And the program effects are concentrated on people who are very poor. So it's moving from like 1,500 calories to about 2,100 calories. Okay. And, and then, uh, so this was, I, I would say for me at least, surprisingly large. Right? And then uh, another important result that helps us think through what happened here is that a year later, three years later, I continued tracking people in both treatment and control villages, but I did not repeat the program in a subsample to be able to look at the long-term effects. And you see that a lot of people we induce to move, they choose to go back on their own in the subsequent years. Not everybody goes back, but we see the people who are more successful are the ones who are more likely to go back. Dina? You mentioned at some point before this talk that they go back and forth within the season several times. Yes. So even that, even if you don't wait the next year, the fact that somebody goes to the city, comes back, Again the same yeah. Season, yeah. Also shows, I guess, that they yeah. Like yes. And right. Exactly. But that's um, yeah. So why do they do that? So we'll see the repeat migration also playing an important role in the results I'll describe to you today. One of the reasons they do that is that remittance is difficult, right? And you're missing your family, and it's yeah. unpleasant to be in the city away from your family. So you go for a few weeks. You come back with money. You rest up, see your kids, and then you go back again during the so same the season. Fact that you pay them one time to yeah. Go? Multiple times. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We only insure or subsidize one trip. Okay. Okay. And then, and then in the earlier this econometric paper, we, you know, the research turned to asking the question, okay, if this is so good in so many ways where people, you can get people to go, they eat a lot more than they choose to go back on their own, then why the heck did we have to run this program? Right? Because they should have been going anyway. Right? So then if you write down a model with some individual specific labor market uncertainty and risk averse people, right? and some facing subsistence risk, where if they lose the $10 travel cost and have nothing to show for it, something devastating might happen. That can explain these results. Okay? However, this model that we wrote down, uh, we also admit in that paper that it's not a fully quantitatively satisfying explanation for everything we see in the data. Because if you allow people to be very rational, forward-looking, et cetera, right, and have no savings constraints, right, then what should happen is that like they have income fluctuations, so any year that they have a couple of extra bucks, they should like put it aside, get it to ten dollars, and then convert it into a bus ticket and go. Okay, so if you allow them to do that, then you know the model pu puts a heavy emphasis on how risk averse they must be, for us to make sense of everything that we see. Right. So anyway, that's something that we're still continuing to work on. Like, uh, uh, how can we explain what's going on here? All right. So now, what's happened now? With this, and this uh, goes to your question is that, uh, so there, once we got these results, right, there are some 
very nice, rich people who, uh, who said, oh, why don't we think about this as development policy? Okay? And so the program, you know, they were thinking about like, scaling this up. So evidence action that Dina is on the board of, right? They are great implementers whose mandate is to do exactly things like this, right? Let's look at ideas that might pass a rigorous cost benefit tells, test and then think about the scale up opportunities, right? And, and there's some money behind it from these nice people, mostly in Silicon Valley, right? And so they're thinking about scaling this up. But like my reaction to all this, I'm, I'm kind of on the researcher uh, reaction, which is look, it's, I mean, it's great that you're interested, but I showed you these results with a sample of 2,000 people. Like if you start in inducing 20,000 or 200,000 people to move, the results might not look the same, right? So we need to keep thinking about this and, and studying this. So that's where we are, and that's where the, this paper comes from. So let's, the first step for me is going to be, let's look at what happens to the rural economy, the spillover effects on the broader rural economy. And then next, uh, when we think about scaling up to the next level, we'll think about what happens to the urban economy. Okay? And at the end, I'll, I'll give you a roadmap of all the different checks that we're doing. Okay? All right, so in the paper that I'll describe today, okay, so we're going to move to expanding migration offers to around 6,000 households in a sample of where about 36,000 people live. Okay? So we're moving to a, from a 2,000 sample to like a 36,000 sample type setting. And then the key thing for studying the rural effects is that not only are we going to have this random variation is inducing some people to move, we're also going to randomly vary the proportion of the eligible population in a village that's induced to move. Right? So the variation will be like not only randomly assigned bus tickets or, or the cash for bus tickets, but also like in some villages, let's say in this village, we'll, we'll give the bus tickets to about say 10% of the population right, who are poor, and in this village, we'll offer the bus tickets to 70% of the population, okay? And that's going to induce different size labor supply shocks, right, which can be used to study what happens on the rural economy. So that will also require us to collect data not only on the people who are receiving the offers, but also on what we might think of as spillover households, the so non-offered households, right? So we'll do that as well. And then um, we'll collect, because a lot of these spillovers might be in the labor market, and this is a population where it's very difficult for us to collect income information because people do a variety of things, right? Doing some agriculture, some non-agriculture, sometimes it's family labor who they're not paying, right? So to get around that, we'll collect high-frequency data. So in an eight-week period where they typically migrate, we'll visit those households six times to ask them over the last eight days, every member of the household, what do they do? Okay, how many hours did they work? Where did they work? How much did they earn? Etc. Right, and and it's by all for all household members, so we can also look at intra-household substitutions and labor supply if some people move, etc. Okay, and then to look at market-level effects, we'll collect data from employers to study wages. Right, so the cultivators, people who have land, who are hiring these poor landless guys. Right, what's happening to their profits? What's happening to the wages they pay, and how they how they're doing their business. Okay, and another general preliminary effect that I was worried about is that say that you induce people to migrate, right? So they go and earn more money, okay? And they bring money back, but food markets are not well integrated, and so there's no more food. Then all that would happen is that the price of food would go up, the migrants would be fine, right? And in fact, Giacomo, you have a paper like this, right? With Sima. Uh, the migrant, and that's, after seeing that presentation, that's where I was thinking about this last bullet point. Um, and so the migrants uh, do, do fine, but the non-migrants are worse off because they have the same amount of money and the price of food is higher, right? And so we're going to also collect data on prices to see if that kind of general cooling effect is happening. Tanya. So I know I've had quite a lot of data, but you've got 25% of the population. It's international migration. Yeah. Um, so it's not just people who are from where? From Matlab, it's international Matlab, migration okay. now, depending on that age group. Um, have you yeah. thought about how this is going to um, cause your insulin Yeah, so this, for this population, right, so the, the population we're looking at, right, is uh, m much, much poorer than Matlab, okay, we're in the north, uh, west part of the country, which, which, sorry? Ah, okay, okay, sure, but we're expanding, it turns out that's, a, that's an area with about 15 million poor people, so we're going to expand locally for a while, yeah, uh, so it's much poorer, and within, <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, no, I'm not going to mess with any model of sample, don't worry. <laughs> there's, there's too much development economics riding on this one set sample of people who've been tracked for the last 30 years, right? <laughs> we, can't, we can't mess with that. Uh, and the second thing I should point out is that we're 
we are only targeting the landless people within that group. So it's like the bottom 60% of the population in the poorest part of the country. Okay. All right, so here's our uh, data collection strategy. Okay? So we'll have three types of villages. Control, the low intensity, that's the 10% village I was talking about. High intensity, that's the 70% village. Okay? And then, so in the high intensity village, the blue guys are the ones who will receive offers. Right? We'll have a lot of them. We'll randomly sample some of them for our data set. And we'll also randomly sample some of the non-offered guys. Okay? And then over here, we'll randomly sample the blue and the white guys. There's just fewer blue guys. And over here, we'll just randomly sample few people. Okay? And so we'll have both high frequency data as I said, and I also collect some endline survey because high frequency data is really expensive because I visit them six times and it's focused on labor market outcomes. With endline I can have a broader set of measures. Okay? Do you rule out directly whether any of these blue guys has been has had some uh, uh, migration experience? No no they will have migration experience. Oh uh, they will. So that'll be an important part of the result because one of the spillovers will be that okay. this you know this guy might become more likely to migrate because many of his friends are going. With, none of them had any. No, they, they might have. Like, so we're not going to sample on the, you know, that would be choice-based sampling, so we wouldn't want to do that. Oh, so doing even more, right? Because, yeah, yeah, I mean, so the problem, I mean, the problem is that uh, the random variation here is at the village level, right? So we run out of, no, like, the, the yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, because it's clustered randomization, which is costly. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the full theory in the interest of time, but I want to just cover just one aspect of the theory, which has to do with whether other people move, answering Andre's question. Okay? But then beyond that, like the labor market effects will be pretty obvious. Okay? So here's what I do. So there's going to be two groups in the village, landless and landed. The landless guys are going to be getting my intervention. Like the landed guys, and the, think about the economy as the landed people hire the landless people. Okay. They transact in that labor market, exchanging land for labor. Okay. And um, we're going to give a transfer B for a bus ticket to a pro pro proportion of people. And the experiment is going to be this uh, variable X, which is the proportion of people who are offered the bus ticket. Okay. So just maybe relevant yeah. to understand what you're doing. You get this bus ticket as a match or as a real incentive? Uh, no, we're giving them as a conditional cash transfer. Yeah, yeah, yeah but you It, it, it covers round trip bus fare plus a few days of food. Okay? But, but it also Does comes. It but, but, oh, it's going to be about 10 days of wages during the lean season. Okay. okay? So, so it's not insignificant, but at the same time, you know, the simple answer to your question is that when, when somebody is giving it, right, who they trust, right, of course it also works as nudge or like, you know, that somebody is telling me and they believe in it enough exactly. to actually give me the money yeah. for it. Right? That probably matters. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so now the migration decision will be based on uh, the returns to migration, which is the wage that you get in the migration destination, right? Plus the bus ticket, if, uh, which can be zero or positive, right? Minus some individual specific cost of migration. And let's also put in a shared cost of migration. Right? This, this is related to the, risk, the fact that migration is risky and risk sharing might be important. Okay? And they're going to compare that against the wage at home. Okay? So notice where I've put in this model where, I, where the x plays a role. Right? x is my experiment of how many people are, are getting the bus tickets. So one is that x will play a role in terms of the number of bus tickets I give out. Right? It's also going to play a role in terms of the shared cost, in that if lots of people are getting offers, then the cost individually might be lower. Just think of it simply as maybe they share accommodation or share a ride or something. Okay. It's going to appear there, but it's also going to appear here. And this is going to be the general equilibrium effect, which is if I induce lots of people to move, then maybe the wages will not fall as much in the, in the village. Right? And that might prevent me from going. Okay? So, so given these three terms, right, um, so we can get an expression from the migration rate as a function of x, and then how, my, how the migration propensity will vary as a function of x. Okay? So the first order effect here is just going to be how many people I have in my distribution that's within b of migrating. Right? So like no, larger number of Bs is going to get more people to move. Right? But two second order effects. So one is that if I see a larger number of people moving, right, that might lower my cost of moving, that shared cost. Right? That might make it more likely that I move. Each individual becomes more likely to move. But on the other hand, if I see lots of people moving, 
that might mean that it's a better idea for me to stay back. Okay? So this, the sign of this is ambiguous, right? And the reason I'm pointing this out is this is testable. And the reason is, in my 10% village, I have offered non-offered guys. In my 70% village, I have offered non-offered guys, right? So then I can compare a non-offered guy, like Ethan, who gets unlucky, right? Is Ethan more likely to move than Molly, who got unlucky here? Right? Or, you know, and, and, and so that's going to pin down which of these two effects dominate. Right? And, or, and, or, whereas you can also look at Andre got lucky and got an offer, Terry got lucky and got an offer. Is Andre more or less likely to migrate than Terry is? Because you guys are actually facing the exact same offer. The variation between you is what's happening to other people around you, right? So that's going to be the test. Shouldn't you also think on the expected wage in, uh, of migrating? Because what I'm thinking is, is also an yeah. equilibrium effect. Not that you don't know yes. and there is a lot of dispersion. That's right. When many people around no, then you get a more accurate uh, for, for information. Th of so then I would have to put an X here, right? Um, so it turns out information, lack of information is not the issue at all. So we already ran that experiment, right? Uh, in the control group, I said 30, it turns out 35.9% of people migrate, right? When I provide this information on what the wages are, what the sectors are where you can find work, 35.9% of people migrate. <laughs> okay. So it, it can't be any tighter, right? Yeah. Yes, I'll show you those results. Yes. Yeah. Was the whole network structured estimation of that last part? Because, in fact, it's not only that it's, there's less people who have, you know, more people going and reason to stay or vice versa, but your networks are different between the two groups as well. What do you mean by networks are different? I mean, it's right. You, know, you probably have a bigger network in the group where more people, the 70% have a No, they don't have a bigger network because that's randomly assigned. You're saying that more people in the network might be moving? Is that what you mean? That's correct. Okay, yeah, yeah. So the, yeah. yeah, yeah, so that's the same answer as is, and I'm going to show you those results. Right? I'll, I'll know, so for example, uh, I'll have variation where Ethan got unlucky, he doesn't know anybody who got an offer. Tanya got unlucky, but she knows lots of people who got offers. You'll separate it yeah. 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 Yes? So the, the way the, the, the trade off may also be shaped by the different selection patterns of those who leave. So I'm thinking about the situation in which when, when a few people Exactly. I'll, I'll, I can look at that as well, right? Because I can look at who's the characteristics of people who live, live in the high intensity village versus the low intensity. Do the people in the high intensity village do worse than the people in the low intensity because of the selection? I can show you that. that. Yes, actually, our, no, my co authors aren't here, but uh, the project we're doing in Indonesia, we're replicating this project. It's all about exactly that, right? How much of it's affected by selection? And yeah, uh, I will, we have that paper coming. That's a great idea. I, I agree it's a fantastic idea for people. <laughs> Isn't there yeah. a potential effect on the wage in the urban sector? So perhaps yeah. that village has got somebody from the village already in the urban setting. So the first guys that migrate there know yeah. exactly where to go to ask for a job. But then yeah. once those opportunities have been already used, then, then you, you have to... Yes, absolutely. So that's what I mean by uh, going back to Tari's question, right? That there's going to be general cumulative effects in the city as well when you get to the 200,000 place, right? But then, before that, that, that even before that, the problem is, I mean, I would love to track that. The problem is that you don't see anything happening. And the reason is, even the secondary towns in Bangladesh are millions of people. Like, this is a drop in the bucket, right? And so at this stage of 36,000 people, that's why I'm focusing on the rural area, and that when we go one order magnitude greater, we'll, we'll look at exactly that, right? So over here, you should say, for, to a first approximation, there's really not much action going on, okay? But it, it will happen when, when, when uh, evidence action, if they choose to scale up. Right? And we have to be careful about that. Right? So in this paper, I'm not going to have an X here. But in the next paper, we will. Okay? All right, so I've talked through this. OK, so beyond that, so uh, like the reason to migrate, of course, if more people move, the effects on labor supply, labor demand are going to be exactly in the expected directions, which is if you get me more people to move, right? then there's going to be a bigger labor supply shock in the village, right? The so wages will not fall as much, et cetera. So, so I'm, I'm going to just skip over the rest of the model, right? And we'll just talk about the empirics. Here we go. Um, yeah, let me summarize, OK? So the possible channels of spillover. So one is uh, the take-up rate of the migration offer may depend on how many other people are getting the offer. We just talked about that. Um, so the wages and labor supply in the village will increase with a larger 
uh, wages in the village and labor supply per household right, will increase with the larger labor supply shock. There's going to be some uh, effects on the labor demand side. I'm not allowing in the short run, like with the one year or two year effects, you know, it, it could be that in the long run, you know, the cultivators change their production technology, right? They change the labor capital ratio or something. In the short run, we're just going to look at what happens to their wage bill, their profits, revenues, et cetera. Okay? And, and then we'll also look at the food price effects that I've already talked through. Right? All right, so here's uh, the data. So in, we did this in, during the 2014 lean season. Monga is the name of this seasonal famine. Right? It happens every year, so it has a name. And we, uh, so one thing I should point out is that ideally we would have liked to have done this handout over here. Right? So we'll get you know, less migration than I think we would get in a, like a scaled up version of the program because we did it a little bit late and that just happened to be like you know, money hadn't arrived in time. Okay? Uh, so, but we'll cover as soon as we do the grant handout, we'll, in this critical migration period, we're going to ask, uh, go back and ask every household member what they've been doing over and over. And then we'll do an end-line survey later on. We'll do an employer survey asking them retrospective questions about how much they paid during each of the, like, the harvesting, in, in between the planting, etc. Yeah. So when did you announce uh, who was eligible or who was going to receive the, the grant? Oh, uh, we, we, uh, who was eligible? Like, over here. Okay, so the handout Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, so the first, one, the first set of results I'll show you. Um, first, I'm going to look at the individual level migration response, right? And then I can aggregate all this up to look at the village level response, which will be my first stage, right? Okay, so here's the individual level response. And uh, in a lot of these tables, I'll have four coefficients estimated because there are five groups, right? There's the high intensity offered, non offered, low intensity offered, non offered, and then there's a the control group. So control will be my omitted category, so all of this is relative to the control. So what you find is, so compare this uh, coefficient to this one. So this is the lucky guys. So this was, this is Ethan, and then this was Molly, right? So Ethan got an offer, and a lot of his friends got offers, or a lot of his neighbors got offers. Molly got an offer, but not many of her friends or neighbors got offers, right? So what you see is, Ethan is 40 percentage points more likely to migrate, and Molly is only 25 percentage points more likely to migrate, right? So he reacts more strongly than she does to the exact same offer. Okay? And that also shows up in the Andre, Andre versus Terry comparison, where Andre is now becoming, even though he's not receiving an offer and he's facing the full price of migration, he becomes significantly lo more likely to migrate, 10 percentage points more likely to migrate than the control group. But that's not true for Terry. Okay? So basically, this means that I'm going to have a pretty strong first stage, right? So not only are Am I making more offers here? Like, so I'll get a higher level village, higher, villi higher, higher village level migration rate. I'm also seeing that each individual is more likely to take it up. So migration rate difference between low intensity and high intensity will be even larger. Question? I'm just wondering how much the mean and the control group varies across the village? Ah, um, so I, I don't know the answer to the question, but in terms of, I can tell you the intertemporal variation. This 34%, before I said it was 35.9%. So I now have data for eight years. It always varies between 34 and 37. So, uh, and you know, there is going to be some cross-sectional variation across villages. I just don't know. Oh, why? Why would there be different comparison groups? Well, I'm just, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm just thinking about uh, like the villages capacity, like when comparing 70% versus 10% of the villages capacity to. Uh, no, I'm making offers regardless of whether people were already planning to go or not. So the 70% is, you know, some people are happy to get it, and that affects their decision. There's the marginal guys, but there are a whole bunch of inframarginal guys who would have gone anyway, but they're happy to get an extra 10 bucks, right? All right, uh, one other thing I point out in this table is that, so I, I talked about the extensive margin here, like moving from non-migration to migration. Uh, like, it doesn't really change the number of migrants. It's not inducing you to go uh, to send a second person from the household. Uh, and it's changing, so, so these numbers are very similar to these numbers, right? But it is ch changing the number of migration episodes only because of what Dean already pointed out, which is people go more than once, right? So on average, uh, across the eight years, I see about 1.8, 1.9 trips per migrant in this, in this sample. Plus, is it transferable or not transferable? No, it's cash. No, it's not transferable. Two sons in a household, and we're 
ordinarily going to send the high skill son to the city, but because you gave a bus ticket to the low skill son, he's going to be the one that goes, but then my wages in the village are going to go up because now instead of sending my highest skill person to the village, I'm sending. Okay, so we can, I mean, it doesn't show up in terms of looking at number of, like it doesn't show up as like the second son also goes, that's what I have here, but we can also look at who goes, right? And I, I, I haven't looked at that, I look at it, but I, I can give you a quick answer because I looked at it for the earlier paper, right? It's in 100% of the cases it's male, right? 84% of the cases the household head and the rest is the oldest son. So it's, there's actually not much variation that I saw in the earlier paper where I had treatment and control in terms of who goes. It's at the household level. Oh, oh, oh! I, oh, I, 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 I thought you meant across households. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's transferable within the household, but not across households. Right. And when you say risk cost sharing, you have in mind that two people may share the accommodation in the city. or We'll look at that right now. Okay. So why is that? Why is this happening? Why is it that Ethan's more likely to go than uh, Molly? Right. So one possibility is that you know people share accommodation. Right. And I actually see nothing like that here going on. Okay. Another possibility is that people travel together, right? And you do see something, uh, something like that going on. And so it seems more about risk sharing, which is related to our earlier paper, which is that, look, if three of us travel together and one person doesn't find a job, it's not as, it's not as bad. But you don't know nothing about pre-treatment relationships? Is there like I, I do, I do. So, ah, so here, here, here we are. Okay. Your friends are the ones yeah. who go so, so the bottom line result is, uh, so this is answering the qu your question and, uh, and Tanya's question from earlier, right? The bottom line result is that if you receive an offer yourself, right, it doesn't matter as much whether your friends also received an offer in your decision to go. But if you don't receive an offer yourself, right, then it matters a lot, right? If you don't receive an offer yourself, then you don't go if you, nobody you know is going, right? So that's what we have here. So, I've, so of course, there's lots of coefficients there because I have the four types of people, times like do I know somebody, do I know somebody well, who's receiving an offer, et cetera. But take my word for it that that summary was accurate, right? <laughs> I can go through this slowly, but the summary was accurate. Okay. The reason I asked particularly yeah. about relatives is because yeah. within the household, they might share assets. So if you go, I actually have an incentive to stay rather than... Ah, so, so we have to define relative more carefully here, right? Yeah. So do you mean two brothers who are yeah. sharing the same cooking yeah. pot? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. If, yeah. So, but that shows up here, that the number of migrants is actually not changing any more than the extensive margin. So it's not going, moving in either direction. Right? But I, I thought we were talking about relatives across households. Which is... All right, so all of this together will tell me my first stage, right? So this is now a village level regression with my 133 villages. So what you see is in the low intensity treatment relative to control, you know, these uh, offers led to an extra seven percentage point migration. So it's going from 35 to 42, right? And in the high intensity treatment, it led to an extra 30 percentage point migration, right? So it's moving from that 35 to 65, okay? Uh, so it's not everybody, Tariq, but it's like two thirds of the people who are, who are leaving, okay? Um, okay, and then one other thing I wanna show you is that this is just repeating results from the earlier paper. I just wanted to also look at longer term effects. It turns out there's also re-migration happening the following year. Okay, so this is result, th these are data from 2015, 16, and the treatment was done in 2014. So I'm going back during the next manga season. Okay, so, and I have the old results from the first year, just for comparison here. So remember, uh, Molly had 24, right? Percentage point extra uh, propensity to migrate. It becomes 19 the second year. Ethan had 40, it becomes 30. So three quarters of people who were induced to go choose to go back on their own absent any further interventions. Right? So this is something that we saw in the earlier paper as well. Right? And then another interesting one, I mean, could be a fluke, but pretty much everybody who was induced to go, who didn't receive an offer themselves in the high intensity village, they seem to choose to go back. Yeah? All right, so now I'm gonna start with, now, okay, so now that's all the first stage, like what the effects on migration were. Bottom line is, people go, and if you do high intensity, pe people uh, have a higher propensity to take up the offers. Okay? And, and so now we're gonna, I'm going to start with the end line survey, where I, not the high frequency survey, I'll get to that later. Right? So what was, the income, what was the income effects here? Right? So these are all intent to treat. So I have the exact same set of four uh, offered, non-offered, low intensity, offered, non-offered, high intensity. Okay? So what you see is that income from migration goes up, right? 
it goes up among um, people who are offered, right? But it also goes up among people who do not receive the offer. Right? So one way that some economists define general equilibrium is like it's inclusive of all the spillovers that could come from migration as well as like wage effects and labor market effects, et cetera. Right? This could be one way to think about general equilibrium. That's a very specific definition, right? This is not necessarily through the wage effect. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, so we can compare each one to $8.50. So $8.50 would be about uh, so two things I should say. Okay? So one is, remember, this is intent to treat. So the $4,800 i am getting is from you know, a combination of migrants and non-migrants. Right? Over here is a combination of migrants and non-migrants. And therefore, this number is smaller than this. But that doesn't mean that the high-intensity guys were more successful. It's just the, it's just the composition is different. Right? And these numbers are a lot larger than if you just were to eat the $8.50. Okay? Um, so we, and we, we do that calculation very carefully using food price data, et cetera, in the earlier paper. Right? Uh, so the bottom line I can give you is, you know, off of that $8.50 transfer, the migrants earn about $110 on average in the city. Okay? And it's, I mean, like they had to convert it to something and get something out of it. They couldn't just eat it. Okay? These, are, these are larger than the initial, initial amount. All right, so now, so that's the effect on income. There's absolutely zero effect on savings. So these are extremely poor people, as I said, right? They're eating everything, okay? as they probably should. And, and then, we, then I look at, okay, so what happens to non-migration income, given that some people are leaving, right? This might just simply displace uh, income that they would have earned at home, right? So here you do see that it displays some of it. The 3,500 goes to 2,700, 4,800 goes to 3,200, right? But not all of it. So on that, they seem to be doing better, right? And then a year later, we collect the migration data again, and you see the number is actually bigger. And why is that? That could be the selection that you were talking about, Francesca was talking about earlier, right? Which is that in the second year, it's a three-quarter positively selected people who are going, and their outcomes are better. So it allows, and another benefit here is that it allows people to learn whether you're good at this or not, right? And then you make a better choice, and non-migration in the future is also kind of a success, which is, I learned that this is not for me, right? Okay, so now, now going to... Can you actually check that the, because I mean, migration rates were, were a little bit lower, right? Think, uh, yes. Right, can you actually check that these guys were the, those that uh, in the first uh, collection were making more money? Yeah. Okay, I, I haven't checked yet, but that's a good, good, that's a good suggestion, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we, we have the ability to do it, so yeah, yeah. do it. All right, so now, um, this, this now allows me to answer Francesco's question. So I can, so over here, I don't know whether low or high intensity guys are doing better. The way to answer that would be to instrument migration by the treatment. So I can't do this in the ITT setting, right? And then look at how much do people, how much more do people earn, migrants in the high intensity villages earn, relative to migrants in the low intensity village. And Francesco's, uh, uh, hypothesis would have been that in the low intensity village, I might see a larger effect because people are traveling in that group, people are traveling off of a less attractive offer, which is that I'm getting an offer, but my friends aren't going. Right? Uh, it turns out it goes like, you know, so we run that IV regression, it goes in the opposite direction, but these are not significantly different from each other. Okay? So the numbers seem a little bit higher for the high intensity village, they seem to do on average a bit better. But the p-value on this is 0.18. Okay, so 4,600 versus 6,100, it's not significant. And if I use four instruments here, offer, non-offer separately, right, the story doesn't really change. Okay? So they seem to be do, doing equally well or equally poorly, whatever it is. Okay, okay and, um, and one other way to look at it is, okay, I can, I'm, I'm just showing you descriptive stats here in the different... Uh, different types of villages, right? What is like your unemployment risk when you're, when you're in the city, okay? And it turns out it's not very different, okay? So, so I mean, there doesn't seem to be very strong selection, okay? I also looked at like whether the education levels of the people who are choosing to go in the low intensity versus high intensity, are they different? But you don't see any, any significant differences. Yeah, so we, uh, so in the first uh, table I put up, I had like migration episodes, et cetera. I could also look at number of days away, right? 
that's entirely explained by the extensive margin, right? So it's not changing um, between low and high intensity. It's not changing the uh, duration of travel. However, one thing that we should keep in mind is that the control group migration experience is very different. So those guys stay longer, right? Why is that? One is that you know they have better remittance technology because they've been going on their own, right? And another one is that they have a pre-existing job connection, right? And uh, and so so those guys actually conditional on migration, those guys will do better, but that's expected because they're a selected group, right? All right. Um, another thing we looked at on this paper, uh, this is getting into the inside baseball of evidence action, I think, is like, okay, what happens in the non-lean season? Actually, when I gave the talk in Cambridge, one of your colleagues was asking me about this a lot. Okay, so then I put this question in <laughs> after getting that comment. Okay, so in the lawn lean season, we ask a lot of like food security questions because we're asking them like retrospective information, right? And it turns out that like the frequency of downsizing meals or like missing a meal and things like that, these frequencies go down, not just during the lean season, but not also in the non lean season when you are, when lots of people are induced to migrate from your village, right? So now I'm, using the, now I'm using my first stage to instrument the proportion of people who are moving. Yeah? Sorry? How does it work that way? I mean, there's no saving increase, so... Uh, there's no... Uh, um, why is it that they are less likely to downsize meals? there's a good reason, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, uh, I had thought about this. I'm just... Um, it's late, so... Yeah. Okay, let, let me, let me uh, think about this some more and I'll tell you afterwards. I've... Okay, so now I'm going to go to this high frequency labor market survey. So this is where I can find out, I, I can ask people questions about like each person, how much do they work at home, how much do they work away from the village, etc. right? So I'm going to show you like income split by home income versus away income uh, and days worked, home versus away. Okay? And so let's start with this, offered grant in the high intensity treatment village. So this is my Ethan, right? So what you see is income goes up, right? And a lot of it is coming from income earned away, right? But what's surprising about this is that this is a positive coefficient, the income at home. The reason I'm saying it's surprising is that in a household, I'm inducing the main income earner to go away, right? And in spite of that, I'm seeing a positive effect on how much they earn at home. Right? You would ex I would have expected a negative effect because the main guy is gone. But it didn't insist on that. Yeah, so let's, we'll, we'll, we'll have to think. I mean, so there's many different explanations for it. The first thing I thought of when I saw this was that maybe Ethan's wife, like now that Ethan's gone, maybe his wife or his eldest son or somebody starts working, right? And, and given that Ethan and many people like him are away, it's easier for them to find work, right? Uh, but we'll explore that. It turns out that's not true. Okay. Um, all right, so, and then I also see a positive coefficient in the number of days worked at home. Okay, so overall, most of the increase is coming from away work, but it's also positive here. Okay, and another thing I'll point out here is that this is the total income, total income of home, away, etc., for the non-offered guys in the high-intensity village. Okay, so this is like inclusive of everything that might be in general equilibrium, which is my response to the treatment, my going myself, uh, go, uh, or that I benefit from higher wages at home because a lot of people are away, right? So this summarizes, this is a good summary statistic for all of those things, right? So this is like, a, this is the bottom line spillover effect. That even though I'm not making offers to this guy, I'm, not, I'm never talking to this guy, they do better just because I've induced other people to move, okay? Um, and where is this coming from? So, so I start exploring that. So the first thing I'll show you is uh, I, you know, I have income, I have day's work, so I can compute daily income, income divided by day's work to get like an imputed wage uh, as, as the migrants reported. And that's going up, right, if more people migrate. Okay? And then I can go to my employer survey, like totally separate data set, and I can just ask them directly what wages did you pay. Right? And I can ask that in the low intensity village and the high intensity village. And so what you find is if an extra 10% of people are induced to emigrate out, right? Wages go up by about 1.7 to 2.6%, okay? The reason I have two numbers here is that for a set of 100, uh, 117 villages, I have really good data on total population. The other 16 villages I don't, right? So I, I just separate that out, 
Okay? So for every 10% increase in emigration, wages go up by, say, 2%, and I induce an extra 30 percentage points in emigration. So wages are increasing in this economy by about 6%. And I'm only seeing this in the male agricultural wage. Okay? Because it's males who are migrating. It's sensible. Males who are migrating. And mostly they, uh, uh, they would be doing agricultural work at home. There was a question here. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at that. I, ha I have something on unemployment. Uh, I, I'll have to. Yeah, but the, but the problem is that that's not an easy question to ask off of a, for an employer, right? The reason is, like, uh, that's not measured in units, but it's more like um, number of employment hours, and sometimes it's family. Like, my son is working for me for free. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I can look at wage bill. That's what I could ask them, right? And from the migrant surveys, I can try and do something about that. Like, what's happening to unemployment there? Yeah. Could there be a technology channel? Like, I go to the city, I learn about fertilizer, and so I come back and I tell people that it's good to use fertilizer. Okay, but that wouldn't, but but I wouldn't be rewarded with a higher wage because I told them about fertilizer. Ah, okay. Okay. So, all right. So, what we'll, okay, good. So, what I'll, uh, so that's the story. And then Andrew Foster had a slightly different story, which was nutrition based efficiency wages, right? So, another way this could happen is like people are going, like they're eating better food, they're getting stronger, and they go back and have uh, higher wages. So, the way I can address this uh, imperfectly is I can look at what happens to the non migrants, right? Which I think I do uh, here. Yeah, I, so it's not a perfect test. That's why I said it's an imperfect way to answer the question. You said that what you just showed doesn't happen for uh, women and children. Why like it doesn't happen for women? The poor in Kosovo they also eat too much. So could you Ah, okay. I see what you're saying. So, so that, okay, so the, your, the answer, answer to your question might be that, look, I'm, I'm seeing it in the male agricultural wage, but not female. And you might expect your story to be equally true for both males and females, right? I think that's, I mean, that also has some imperfections here because, you know, markets are a bit segregated, but and that's the best we can do. Yeah, it's, it's, quite, it's very large. So we can't really say, then, yeah. Because, and the reason is, look at how many female, like how many employers are saying, yeah. yeah. Females are not very common to hire for agriculture in Bangladesh. Yeah. I don't remember they collected it on landowners, actually. you know, some point they're going to run out of labor. I mean, there's not much to do. Yeah, yeah, actually we do. So I'll, I'll show you what's happening to them. Yes, yeah, so somebody has to pay for this, right? Yeah. <laughs> it turns out they do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So not, no, this is not like a nice rosy picture for everybody in the world, right? Like some people are earning more, right? And there's some richer landowners who are paying for this. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Do you know when they uh, migrate? Because uh, originally it's in the lean period. Nobody, if you, you observe this increasing wages, maybe that when they learn that it's good to go to the city, then they start also going uh, during the, 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 the... Yeah, actually, uh, in general, people go during other periods as well. So some of the spillovers that we see is not just in the next lean year, but in other periods. That be and that actually might be the answer to... Wages, no? That might be the answer to Giacomo's question, which is that now I've... Here, here's, Okay, here's, here's a story that I've heard. Uh, I love the anecdotal evidence title of your slide. Um, so I'll give, you one, I'll give you some. So the story is that, look, the migrant goes, um, migrant goes to the city during the lean period because I subsidize the travel, right? And then the employer says, okay, you've proven yourself to be a reliable worker, so come back again and you can have the same job, right? And that type of migration you can do throughout the year. You don't have to go just during the lean period. Okay. So now, uh, so remember, I was, okay, so I, I want to just push through one main story and then I'll, I'll take a bunch of questions, okay? So remember, I was, I saw this positive effect that I was puzzled by, right? So I want to now understand why is it that I'm getting higher income in the village even though I'm inducing people to move out, the main income earner to move out. So the first thought I had was maybe the wife or somebody else works, okay? So then I look at the subsample of like everybody other than the main income earner, and absolutely nothing happening. Right? Uh, not only are the effects insignificant, they're actually really tiny. Okay? 
So it's not intra-household substitution and labor, okay? And why is that? And I'm now I'm just showing you some descriptive stat, which is the main income earner accounts for not only most of the income earned at the migration destination, he also accounts for most of the income earned at home. Right? This is the guy who works, both at home and in a way. Okay? So now then the question is, okay, how is it possible for him to be both working at home and away? <laughs> right? uh, un unless he's a quantum worker. Um, and the answer is, right, he actually spends, like the answer is what Dina was talking about earlier, which is these guys move back and forth. He spends about a third of his time away, right? And we're seeing multiple trips, okay? And not only that, what happens is that when in the high intensity village, somebody's away, right? And in and the week that they come back, there's fewer people around because lots of other people have been induced to move and they're not all traveling in week one and coming back in week four, right? Some are going weeks one, two, three, others are going four, five, six, others are going two, three, and five, six, okay? And so I co compute, so basically I compute the probability that an ever migrant is at home when another randomly chosen ever migrant from that village is away because I have you know, the week by week data, that's the benefit of the high frequency. It turns out the probability is pretty high. Right? That says that people are not traveling, they're traveling in staggered ways. Okay? So what's happening is that these guy, this guy comes back home and it's easier for him to find work. Okay? And let me show you, um, show you how, how we generate that. Okay? So now we look at the primary worker's labor market outcomes just at home, so income at home, and I just focus on periods when he is actually at home. Okay? So I compare the control migrant, uh, or sorry, com com control primary worker to the low intensity to the high intensity primary worker, and what you find is, like it nicely stacks up with extra 60 taco of income uh, for the low intensity, extra 88 for the high intensity. Okay? So, and, and, he, and he also has more work available, so he's less likely to be unemployed. Okay? Now there's one problem with this analysis, which is that in the high intensity guys, they're away more often, right? So it could be that they're choosing to come back home during the week that it's most attractive to be at home, like a high season in, at home, right? So that might mess up this comparison. So what I do is I just focus on the period that's the best period to be at home in the control village compared to the best period uh, in the treatment village, right? So I do that next, and now I have one-sixth the amount of data, so standard errors are larger, but it lines up in exactly the same way, okay? And the statistical significance here disappears, but I get 69, 74, it lines up the same way. And then unemployment, you know, this, this is a partial answer to the... Well happens, right? Sorry? On the wages, it's not Yeah, so it's... So it's just the labor opportunities. Yeah, it's significant here, the daily income. When I use six periods, okay. I, six periods, when I do one period, it still lines up the same way. It's just not significant because standard errors go up. Okay. Yeah? So does that explain all, all the income home and weight that you were starting to Exactly, yeah. Because that was, it was actually a small amount to explain. Yep. Explains all of it. And then another thing I'll show you is the unemployment rate, right, uh, at home, right? So you see in the control group, it's like 12%, like week by week when I have these data. It's in the low intensity group, it's about 10, 11%, and in the high intensity group, it's 6%. Yeah? So people are actually doing things rather than sitting around when lots of other people are away. Right? That seems to be the way it works. Okay, I have one minute, so I won't be able to answer all the employer questions, but here's the summary. It increases the wage bill because like, there's a direct pecuniary externality here, right? That they have to pay more. Yeah? And there's a small increase, insignificant, in the non wage costs. There's no significant change in revenue, but all of these put together significantly lowers their profits. Okay? So employers here are worse off, which you might worry about, but if you care about inequality, it's going in the right direction. Okay? So let me skip over that and conclude. Ah, food price. Um, nothing, I mean, I looked at lots of food items, nothing systematic going on. In fact, when I see significant effects is that food prices are dropping, right? And it's dropping for the exact same items that are common for migrants to just carry back, right? So they bring back bags of rice from the city because the prices are lower, right? And you see food prices for rice and sugar dropping. That, uh, other things are not changing. So, so there's, you know, that my worry about food prices was misplaced. Milk goes up. Sorry? Milk goes up. Oh, milk goes up, yes. Thanks. So could they be sugar? Uh, I do see in the earlier paper that they start getting more protein from milk and eggs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The demand for milk does go up. Not as well. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'll, um, all right. So let me just let me just conclude, and then um, uh, we'll talk. Okay. Um, all right. So so this is a paper on labor market spillovers. So we I, we also are writing a paper on spillovers to risk sharing channels, uh, which we're presenting in the at the NBR development meetings next month. And the idea there is, look, if, if you induce some people to move out, and these guys were part of a risk-sharing network, right? And you know, some the smart, productive people move out, then they might be less likely to participate in risk-sharing networks with other people, right? Because it, it, it now becomes harder for me to, uh, well, the participation constraint is more bi binds more. It's harder for me to track what these guys do and their income. So there's also this um, moral hazard problem, right? On the other hand, if somebody from my network has a different income stream, that's unrelated, un less correlated with my income stream, that might be better for insurance. So in theory, it could go in opposite directions. And the answer we find is that it's actually positive. Okay? And then um, David Lagakos, Mike Wah, and I are thinking about the welfare effects. So here we're thinking about, OK, you know, the fact that income and consumption goes up, that's not necessarily improving welfare, because it's coming with some family separation, or it's coming with the migrant having to live in an urban slum. Right? And there's some unmeasured disutility there. So we're using a lot more theory to try and make progress on that question. Okay? And the answer there we get is that the welfare effects are definitely a lot smaller than the consumption effects are. Okay? Because there's unmeasured disutility for, for sure. Okay? Effects on urban areas, which is what you wanted to know, uh, that's going to happen in a couple of years. Or results will happen in a couple of years. And we also looked at unintended non-economic effects. So I'm worried that if I induce lots of people to move, right? Maybe they bring back diseases home, right? Or they carry diseases to the city. Or that divorce rate goes up, and husbands and wives don't get along anymore, right? Or the kids are worse off because the father is away. So we tracked all of these things. We basically get a lot of zeros here, right? The only counterexample would be, like, the, the weeks that the husband's away, somebody has to make decisions, so the wife does, right? But as soon as he comes back, it just goes back to status quo. Like, this is not economic empowerment for women <laughs> at all. Unlike microcredit, apparently. Um, OK, so now you know, we're replicating other countries. And yeah, generally, especially for any grad students in the audience, we want to understand a lot more the seasonal dimension of poverty. Because we think about poverty as chronic, but there's a big component of seasonality here that we need more evidence on. Okay? I'll stop.